There are a lot of ites in the Bible. The Israelites, the Amalekites, the Moabites, the Hittites. But among the ones to receive the worst reputation are the Canaanites. The Bible doesn't say too much about the Canaanites, but the main narrative comes from the book of Joshua. The Canaanites were a people destined to be conquered. After Moses' death, Joshua was called to lead the people of Israel into the land of Canaan, a land today roughly spanning the modern state of Israel, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, Jordan, Lebanon, and southern Syria. Upon entering the land, Joshua and the Israelites defeat Jericho, a strong-walled Canaanite city, but they continue to do a lot of conquering, culminating in Joshua 12, which lists 31 Canaanite kings whom Joshua and the Israelites apparently defeated. The focus is somewhat different in the Book of Judges. Here we get lots of statements about the Israelite tribes not driving out Canaanites, nor destroying their cities. The focus is very much on the Israelites as God's chosen people, and the Canaanites as conquered peoples that continue to infiltrate the Israelites and lead them astray. But let's set aside Joshua and Judges for a moment as we turn to the archaeological evidence to answer the question, who were the Canaanites, and what happened to them? Archaeologists view the Canaanites as the main population and native cultural group of the Bronze Age in this region before the appearance of the Israelites. And as we'll see from the archaeology, the Canaanites lived in big cities, worshipped in big temples, and survived under the thumb of the Egyptian Empire. Let's focus in on the 1300s BCE. Canaan during the Late Bronze Age. This was a region on the edge of Egyptian imperial control. Though not a significant center of power, Canaan played a crucial role as a cultural and commercial crossroads. See, there were two major road systems, the Coastal Route and the King's Highway, that connected Egypt with Syria, Mesopotamia, and ultimately the whole Aegean world via the Mediterranean coast. Canaan sat at the heart of it all. These routes spurred the development of long-distance trade that financed some of the biggest cultural achievements of the Canaanites that we'll talk about, including their urban culture, their monumental architecture, palace bureaucracies, and their cult practice. I want to focus on the 1300s because we get a pretty clear snapshot of the political situation in Canaan during this time because of the Amarna Letters, a huge cache of clay tablets discovered in Egypt dating to a few decades in the Late Bronze Age. Basically, they comprised an administrative archive. Of the almost 400 known tablets, a big percentage of them record correspondences between Egyptian officials and the kings of small city-states in Canaan. For example, a few letters are from the Canaanite king of Ashkelon, a coastal city known as a major trading center due to its location along the coastal road. Notice how servile and obsequious the Canaanite king is to the pharaoh. He calls the pharaoh, my king, my lord, my god, and he calls himself your servant, the dirt at your feet, the groom of your horses. He promises to the pharaoh that he'll continue to guard Ashkelon in accordance with the command of the king. Another letter is from the king Abdi Heba, from a city you might have heard before, Arushalim, or Jerusalem. King Abdi Heba begs the pharaoh to send reinforcements as he skirmishes with other Canaanite city-states. Letters like these are important in reconstructing Canaanite society, as well as political, economic, and religious relations with the Egyptians. They clearly illustrate the tight Egyptian grip on the region. Canaanite kings were sending them tribute, acting as vassals of the Egyptian empire, and begging the Egyptian leaders to settle disputes. This control is also evident in just how much Egyptian stuff turns up in Bronze Age excavations in the region. For example, check out the city of Beit Shan, located a few kilometers south of the Sea of Galilee. On top of the tell, archaeologists discovered an Egyptian administrative center, including an Egyptian temple, the house of an Egyptian governor, and Egyptian inscriptions. These remains suggest that a bunch of Egyptians must have been stationed at different Canaanite sites, serving both administrative and military functions despite the distance from the Egyptian heartland. Overall, the role of Egypt in the Late Bronze Age was not to colonize Canaan, but rather to administer the collection of tribute, to impose security arrangements, and in force a semblance of order on the quarrelsome Canaanite rulers. The material evidence from late Bronze Age Canaan provides an excellent case study for identifying political activities of a dominant and imperialistic Egyptian power. Another thing we learn from the Amarna letters is that the Canaanites were by and large an urban civilization. 
The region was basically a collection of city-states. The tablets mention approximately 20 of them. This includes Jerusalem, as well as lesser-known cities like Megiddo, Gezer, Hatzor, and Ashkelon, all major Canaanite cities that you can visit to this day. Many of them had impressive fortifications. For example, check out this huge gate at Ashkelon. Built mostly of brick and limestone, the gate is 15 meters long. This is some pretty impressive infrastructure for its time. Another great example of Canaanite urban living is Megiddo. You might have heard of it before. The Bible mentions it about a dozen times, including the book of Revelation, where it says that at the end of time, a great battle will be fought at Armageddon, or Har Megiddo the Mound of Megiddo. Located in the Jezreel Valley, Megiddo was strategically situated on a trade route, making it the ideal setting to become super wealthy and super powerful. In the Bronze Age, Megiddo was a big deal. It had huge fortifications, including a multi-chamber gate and a mud brick wall that enclosed the city. Throughout the Bronze Age, the inhabitants constructed monumental palaces and fancy houses for the elites. It was one of the crowning jewels of Canaanite civilization. So, Canaanites liked their urban living, and another key aspect of the city lifestyle was their religion. Now, the Bible mentions Canaanite religion here and there, usually tied to the god Baal, but we learn a lot more from the archaeology. Some of these major Canaanite cities that we've mentioned so far had big temples right in the city center. These were monumental temples with two or three rooms, including an inner sanctuary that scholars sometimes call a Holy of Holies, borrowing language from the Temple of Solomon from the Hebrew Bible. We find temples like this at Megiddo, but the city of Hatzor is another great example. Hatzor is located north of the Sea of Galilee and was a major Canaanite hub in the Bronze Age, the largest Canaanite city in the southern Levant. The Book of Joshua even calls it the head of all Canaanite kingdoms. Hatzor covered about 200 acres of space, which encompasses several temples, including a huge ceremonial precinct on the top, variously identified as a palace or a temple. So what gods were Canaanites worshipping at these sites? Well, there were a lot of Canaanite gods, but I want to focus on two in particular. In one of the rooms in that huge precinct at Hatzor, archaeologists discovered a bronze statue of a god dating to the 14th century BCE. And it's pretty hefty. 35 centimeters high, it weighs 3 kilograms of solid bronze. Many scholars think it represents the Levantine storm god Baal, based on his clothing and his gesture with his hand held parallel to his chest, which is identified as one of Baal's attributes. But as much press as Baal gets in the Hebrew Bible, like the prophet Elijah fighting against the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings, he actually was not the head of the Canaanite pantheon. In a lot of Canaanite traditions, that honor goes to the god El. What you're looking at is a figure of the god El, discovered at Megiddo, and dated to about the 1300s BCE. Standing at 27 centimeters high, it's a bronze object coated entirely in gold. El is depicted holding in his left hand a spatula-shaped scepter that could be interpreted as an emblem of the god. Similar spatula scepters have been found around the region, including at Hatzor and Lachish, which some scholars argue may have been held by life-size statues of the gods that have since been lost. Both Baal and El were also associated with a calf or bull as their animal manifestation, and archaeologists have found figurines of these animals at several Canaanite sites. So, from the archaeological data, we can sketch an image of the Canaanites. They were the native people of the Levantine region, living in city-states like Hatzor, Gezer, and Megiddo, worshipping gods like El and Baal in big temples located in their cities. But these city-states did not form a single political unit. They all lived under the shadow of the Egyptian Empire. While the Book of Joshua says that the Israelites invaded Canaan after fleeing Egypt and destroyed the Canaanites, the archaeological data appears to primarily say that the Egyptians dominated the Canaanites. Numerous excavations and a bunch of contemporary written documents in the form of the Amarna letters gave us a pretty good picture of the Canaanites, their beliefs, and their traditions during the Late Bronze Age. Yes, most of this period was characterized by an Egyptian dominance and influence, but Canaan served as a cultural crossroads of the region that was essential to Egyptian strategic goals. But Canaanite culture, for all of its achievements, was not to last. The so-called Late Bronze Age collapse was a time of economic and environmental turmoil, leading to the fall of superpowers like the Hittite Empire. 
Canaanite urban society could not be sustained following the collapse of the Late Bronze Age and the implosion of long-distance trade. In the decades that followed, the Canaanites gradually transformed culturally as new groups emerged, including the Phoenicians, the Israelites, and the Philistines. Stay tuned, we'll be learning more about these people groups in future episodes. Hey everyone, that was the second episode in the brand new Patheo series, Excavating the History of the Bible. If you'd like to watch episode one, you should uh, click on the link right here. Uh, stay tuned for episode three, which will be focusing on the origins of the Israelites.